Welcome, good afternoon. Uh, today for Talks at Google, we're very thrilled to have two thought leaders from the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, they're here to discuss their latest book, um, By Any Means Necessary, How China's Resource Quest is Changing the World. And so the economic expansion of China is pretty well documented in the, the press and news, but behind it is a quest for, um, for fuel, ores, water, and um, even land for far farming. And so this book outlines the, the ramifications behind this massive undertaking. So we have actually Elizabeth Economy, the CV Star Senior Fellow and Director for Asia Studies on the, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, she's also um, Vice Chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Future of China. And she serves on the board of the China-US Center for, for Sustainable Development, so coming in from the China perspective. And also we have Michael Levy, um, the David R. M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the, and the Environment at the CFR. And he works um, primarily on, on energy security and climate change, as well as um, nuclear terrorism. So from arms control to sustainability, the, they're true experts in their fields. We'll also have time for a Q&A at the end. But for now, please join me in welcoming them to Google. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Cliff. It's really a pleasure for me and Mike to have the opportunity to be here at Google to uh, share with you our, our research uh, and our new book, um, By All Means Necessary, How China's Resource Quest is Changing the World. Uh, there were a number of reasons why Mike and I decided to undertake this project, but chief among them was our sense that we're in the midst of one of the great transformative processes of our time, namely the rise of China and yet we have only a limited understanding uh, of what that rise means for the global economy, for governance, and for international security. Uh, and so we decided to look at one of the issues that we believe is really at the heart of this rise, namely China's resource quest, its effort to secure resources from outside its borders uh, in order to uh, fuel its economic growth. Certainly there's been a lot of hype uh, in the media surrounding this uh, issue. You know, China can be either the savior of the global economy or the scourge of good global governance or it's undermining international security uh, because of its willingness to do business uh, anywhere uh, at any time. Uh, but Mike and I decided we wanted to look uh, behind the headlines uh, and really explore the reality of the issues. And so we looked at four different sets of commodities, uh, oil and gas, water, land, and minerals. Uh, and we looked uh, throughout the developing world, uh, in Southeast Asia and Africa and Latin America, and also in resource-rich uh, advanced industrialized countries like the United States, uh, Canada, and Australia. Uh, and what we found, I think, speaks to sort of six generally uh, held assumptions, or uh, one might call them myths, uh, about this resource quest. And so uh, we're each going to talk about uh, a couple of these uh, myths uh, for about 25 to 30 minutes. And then we're going to welcome, obviously, your, your comments and uh, your questions. Uh, so first sort of commonly held assumption, perhaps the most basic one, is that uh, China's resource quest is unprecedented in history. And on the face of it, if you look at the numbers, uh, it is quite striking. I mean, China commands upwards of 30, 40, even 50% of the global supply of zinc or iron ore, nickel, um, you know, coal, lead. Uh, so clearly, its impact on global resource supply demand is profound. Uh, yet when we look back through history, we find that, that China is really simply following a trajectory uh, that has occur occurred uh, time and again. And in fact, that all rising great powers uh, have sought resources outside their borders to grow their economy. Uh, going back to ancient Athens, uh, which went outside of its borders to get timber and corn. Certainly the United States uh, sought resources uh, from outside its borders, and most recently, Japan. Uh, not many of you probably will remember, but perhaps some of you will, uh, in the early 1970s and uh, 1980s, uh, when there was a lot of concern uh, about the rise of Japan. Uh, interestingly, uh, in the early 1970s, Japan, with about 120 million people, uh, commanded 10% of the world's oil supply. And when you look at China today, you see that China, with 1.3 billion people, commands not much more than about 12% of the world's oil supply. Uh, of course, that speaks to market supply and demand, and Mike's going to talk uh, a lot more about that. Um, but I think it, it gives you some context right, to understand that uh, while China's rise is quite striking, it's not necessarily unprecedented. And it's not even unprecedented in terms of China's own history. Uh, because if you look back thousands of years, uh, in the book we really just look back uh, about 700 years to the Ming Dynasty, 
um, you see that many of the sort of governing traits of China's resource quest that we find today were present you know, 700 years ago, sort of a strong central directive, you know, who can go out for resources, where you can go, uh, what resources you should be going out for, who can profit uh, from this resource quest. Uh, many of these things are sort of deeply rooted uh, from you know, 700 years ago. Uh, in addition, a sort of sense within China of, of insecurity about its resources, particularly when it comes to grain. And again, we track this uh, throughout history uh, up until today, when we find that some uh, aspects of this insecurity are beginning to change. Uh, nonetheless, I think overall, uh, we find in, in this particular case that, uh, yes, China's rise and its resource quest uh, is certainly you know, changing things, but it's not unprecedented. A uh, second thing that we tackle, a sort of second myth or common assumption, is that Chinese firms are somehow advantaged uh, in their competition against w Western multinationals um, because of the very strong engagement uh, by the state, by Beijing. Uh, and indeed, when you read the newspaper, when you open a newspaper, you'll see that you know, President Xi Jinping uh, may travel to Africa or to Latin America or to Southeast Asia, and he'll be accompanied by a dozen uh, ministers or state-owned enterprise heads or representatives of the major uh, Chinese banks. And they will propose a sort of vast array of trade and aid and investment deals as they approach uh, each country. And it can look to the outside observer uh, as though she is you know, a conductor of a very, very sort of finely tuned orchestra, you know, with each section playing its uh, part perfectly and, and in harmony. Uh, but what Mike and I found is that much less harmony and much more cacophony, uh, in fact, uh, and that uh, in many respects, uh, this resource quest does not exactly uh, proceed as we might believe it from the outside. Uh, so for example, uh, the National Development and Reform Commission, which is maybe the composer of the music, right? So it's the one that designs the, perhaps the broad plan for the trade and aid and investment for a given country. Um, may, may lay this plan out, but then it's up to the state-owned enterprises to decide whether or not they want to participate. Uh, and in many instances, they don't want to participate because they see uh, participation as a money-losing uh, endeavor for them. Uh, and they want to make money, and they want to compete on the international stage. Uh, we also found that in many cases, Chinese, uh, particularly in the mining sector, uh, which is largely not state-directed, Chinese go out on their own with no direction from Beijing. Uh, so, for example, uh, looking back about a year ago in March, uh, the Ghanaian government uh, told the Chinese, look, we've got these thousands of Chinese gold miners, uh, and they're here illegally, and they're you know, despoiling our environment. Could you please take care of this problem? And Beijing said, well, no, this is your problem. Uh, we have nothing to do with all of these miners. We certainly didn't send them out or bring them out. Uh, you, know, you need to do a better job of enforcing your own laws and your own regulations. Um, and, uh, you know, come July, uh, Ghana rounded up all of these miners, uh, close to 5,000 of them, uh, and kicked them out. Uh, and so this was a, a black eye for Beijing, but they had nothing to do, you know, with this part of this outward uh, investment or this resource quest, uh, yet it reflects uh, back upon Beijing. Another aspect of, of this um, sort of disaggregation, you know, the sort of the lack of coordination uh, is really when you look at what China proposes for investment and how much of that is realized. Uh, so dating back to about 2007, uh, if you've been following, for example, Chinese investment in Brazil, it totals about $70 billion, which is substantial. But then you look at the realized investment and you find out it's only 30% of that. And some of that has to do, again, with Chinese firms not wanting to participate in what the Chinese government has structured. And some of that has to do with uh, the difficulties of, of doing business in Brazil. Um, and finally, there's this sense that you know, somehow China's got it right, right? That all these Chinese companies are out there making all this money. And that's something else that we found was actually not the case. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a recent, uh, recent announcement by a Chinese mining official uh, that over 80% of Chinese mining investment overseas is not profitable. So when we're reading the newspapers, when we're seeing what's going on uh, with you know, President Xi and, his, and these gigantic deals for investment, uh, you know, what we've discovered uh, is that certainly some of this is taking place, but it's really much less uh, than meets the eye. Why don't I pick up there and talk a little bit about the economics. 
First, though, let me add my thanks to you all for hosting me. It's the first time I've given a talk with a pool table behind me, which is pretty exciting. Uh, I want to talk first, though, about what's happened with the prices of commodities, uh, because that's the way we feel uh, China's resource quest most directly, or at least it's the way we think we feel China's resource quest most directly. Uh, if you look out over the last decade, we've seen far higher prices for oil, for gas, for minerals. Uh, and the story is not just that China has driven this, uh, but that China will continue to drive this into the future. That we've only seen the tip of uh, what's to come and will continually see ever rising resource prices. One of the great things about being able to look at China's rise through this resource quest, though, is that this isn't just speculation about the future. We have a track record. We can dig in and ask, what have we seen and why has it happened? And when we dig in on these different commodities, we learn some things that put a lot more nuance into the picture. So yes, without China, we would not have seen these enormous rises, particularly for oil, for iron ore, for copper, uh, that we saw over the last decade. But the simple story ends there, uh, and let me just flag a couple pieces that, I, that strike me as very interesting. Uh, if you look at forecasters' projections for oil prices around the year 2000, they basically said, we will have $20 oil forever. The really worried ones said, we will have $30 oil. But China's rise isn't what they got wrong. If you look across these projections, you find that they were mostly on target when it came to rising Chinese demand for oil. What they got wrong was they assumed that the rest of the world would expand oil production to respond, uh, essentially as a friendly gesture to keep prices low. That Saudi Arabia and Iran and Kuwait and others would play along, keep prices low for everyone by responding to China's rise. What happened in reality? In reality, Chinese consumption grew. The supply didn't respond in this case probably for political reasons. Uh, and prices had to rise because someone else had to consume less in order to make the pieces add up. Who ended up consuming less? Mostly the developed countries. So here, China is an essential piece of the puzzle in understanding why prices rose. But you can't understand what happened without looking at how the other parts fit in. You have a similar story on the iron ore front. Uh, when you look at the rise of China as a consumer, it's enormous. But in principle, global iron ore supplies can rise to catch up. The issue there is that it takes a long time. And that's the case for a lot of uh, investment and other resources, too. You can't simply turn on the tap overnight. Uh, it takes a long time to plan new mines, to execute them, to get political buy-in in the countries where those are being developed. And in the interim, prices can go through the roof. And that's what we've seen. So we've seen, in that case, a lag in the ability of the big suppliers to catch up. There's another piece that's worth paying attention to, because even though we've seen price rises uh, in a lot of places, we haven't seen them everywhere. So when you look at aluminum, for example, uh, the price of aluminum has not gone up nearly as much as it has for some of these other resources. Why? Uh, because the market was already on the upswing, there was already a lot of anticipated growth in demand, not just from developing countries, but developed countries for things like lighter uh, frames for automobiles to become uh, more efficient and pieces like that. Uh, you also saw the market, this particular market, more flexible and more easily able to respond. And on the food front, you saw big price rises. But if you drill down, there are a host of other drivers, a lot of other developing countries with rapidly growing food demand. Uh, some severe droughts uh, that cut into supply, uh, and on top of that, political reactions to some of those developments that intensified uh, the price impacts. When we look out at the future, all of those dynamics need to come into play. Uh, what we're seeing in particular is the system start to respond, uh, both outside of China and inside of it. We've seen uh, a lot more effort to become more efficient in our use of resources, in general, slowing the growth of demand, not reversing it, but slowing it. Uh, we've seen the supply side respond. Uh, so if you look in oil and gas, for example, enormous transformations in technology that have allowed a lot more production, not at the kinds of $20 prices we saw or expected a decade ago, but without having to go from 20 to 100 and then to 200 and 300 and so on. So the system is starting to respond. 
Uh, and again, I'd emphasize, particularly in China, uh, not only through adoption of technology, but through a, an effort to shift the sources of Chinese growth uh, to rebalance the economy, uh, happening in fits and starts, certainly not uh, accomplished yet. But responses across the board that I think limit the big potential for really large increases uh, in resource prices due to China in the future. We're not going back to uh, the year 2000, uh, but we're probably not going to repeat the last decade uh, all over again either. So that's one side of the economics picture. It's what's the price? The other side is in some ways a deeper and, uh, if you looked at it a decade ago, more troubling one. And that's this question of whether markets will continue to dominate the way we uh, allocate resources, the way we trade, the way we uh, decide who gets what around the world. And the reason that markets are important is because they let you take politics out of the equation. So uh, is it bad to pay more for oil or for ores? Sure. It's a lot worse to have to fight wars over them uh, if you are allocating things politically. And a decade ago, that's what the big claims about China were. China is going to take us away from a market-based system, uh, which has tended to prevail, and toward a political system, a mercantilist system, where you use at best politics and at worst force to allocate the world's supply of, of resources. This is the sort of world that developed uh, before World War II. And we know that didn't end well. So what's the decade of experience tell us? What it tells us is that not only has China been remarkably unsuccessful in transforming the world to a different system, it actually, not, in, not on purpose, uh, but on, in some cases has actually moved into a more flexible, more market-based, less political system uh, than it was in before. Uh, let me tell you a few, a few reasons why. But let me start by flagging the exceptions. And the big exception that stands out is rare earths. Uh, that's because China has a dominant market position. 95% uh, of global rare earths production. Starting to shift gradually, but those responses are slow. So when China controls the vast majority of what's out there, it's able to uh, make the market work differently. But in most cases, China doesn't control the vast majority of what's out there. There are other places where it looks like China is controlling everything, uh, but that's mostly superficial. So uh, do you see a huge volume of iron ore being produced in mines that China has relationships with and sent back to China? Yes. But that's not necessarily so exciting. You don't need to depart from markets to have a lot of copper or iron sent back to China. All you need is the fact that China is a dominant consumer of these resources around the world. Even if others were producing them, they would be making their way back to China. And the iron ore piece, most of the world's iron ore market is uh, structured around vertically integrated firms. You own the mine upstream, you produce, you send it to your uh, steel mills downstream. And Chinese companies in that sense are no different uh, from how others have behaved. On the oil front, where I think most of the controversy has come, uh, people worried about China buying equity oil, investing in oil around the world and then shipping it back home, in some sense taking it away from the global market. Uh, what you find out when uh, you drill down on this is that the bulk of Chinese equity oil, the bulk of Chinese produced oil, is not shipped back to China. It's shipped on to the global market. And it's not shipped to you know, China's favorite political partners. There's a guy in London or New York that uh, the Chinese company hires, and they trade it just like they do any other source of oil to the highest bidder. Uh, there are even places in, in China's periphery, in Central Asia, that have pipelines going straight into China. They will sell it into other pipelines going elsewhere if that's where the profits lie. Let me give you one last, uh, last piece where China, in some ways, accidentally uh, encouraged the creation of a market, and that's iron ore. I'll, I'll tell you, in the, the list of different things that surprised me when we were writing this book, the biggest is that I ended up finding iron ore really interesting. Uh, I never really anticipated that. Uh, it, turns, it turns out, I know you'll be shocked, uh, iron ore is a kind of an interesting world. Uh, until a few years ago, there were three big companies that controlled most of the world's iron ore markets. They sat down with the biggest buyer in Japan. They had a little negotiation among them. They picked the price, and then everyone had to agree to use that price for the entire next year. Okay? Not the kind of marketplace you're used to using. Now, China, when it came on the scene, said, this is a good system. We can be that guy in the room instead of the Japanese. We'll get an even better deal out of them, and this will work out well for us. What happened, though, was you had, and this goes to Liz's point, it's not all about the state, you had 
huge numbers of small steel mills scattered around China, all trying to do their own thing. They didn't want to play that game. They went out, whether the state liked it or not, and bought their iron at whatever price they could get it at. And over time, that built up into a large market. And when the world went through the financial crisis in 2008, and there was an enormous amount of turmoil in the markets, uh, everyone said, and people started to say, we don't like this political negotiating system. We don't like this every year uh, changing thing. They said, well, there's a market. It's being developed, not on purpose, but by accident, by all of these entrepreneurial Chinese firms. And they shifted to that. And today, a few years later, you have a fundamentally transformed market, a lot less political power involved, a lot more open trade, uh, the kind of thing that's good for economies, but also good for international security. So if prices are one of the flashpoints and sort of the media headlines uh, when it comes to China's uh, quest for resources, uh, the other is probably uh, China's impact on the ground uh, in the countries where it's doing investing. So what is China doing in terms of the environment and labor and just good governance, corruption and transparency? Uh, so what we've, what we've taken away from actually a pretty, a pretty uh, detailed set of, of cases and, and research uh, studies uh, on this front um, is that the best way to understand China's impact abroad is really to look at what China's doing on the home front. Uh, so for example, if we can look at China today and the sort of pollution catastrophe right, that it's facing, uh, in part, that's because a lot of Chinese firms don't undertake environmental impact assessments and they're not enforced. Well, you know what? When Chinese firms go to Zambia, oftentimes they also don't undertake environmental impact assessments. So China tends to do abroad what it's doing uh, at home. On the labor front, there were a number of issues uh, that we discovered that were somewhat problematic uh, in terms of Chinese investment. Uh, whether we're looking at Papua New Guinea or Peru, uh, miners there tended to complain that Chinese mining practices were, were sort of bottom of the barrel when it comes to labor and safety. In some cases, it was absolutely true. In most cases, it was true. But in some cases, there were also other Western firms that were, were bottom of the barrel as well. Uh, but by and large, you did not find Chinese firms who were acting to raise sort of labor and safety practices. Uh, so basically, on the pay front and on the safety front, uh, Chinese firms were uh, below par. This is not surprising. The mining industry in China is one of the most dangerous uh, in the world. You know, more mine fatalities uh, per capita than anywhere else in the world. So again, not surprising to find that when Chinese mining companies uh, go abroad, they're bringing those same practices. Uh, in terms of governance and transparency and corruption, um, one of the interesting uh, trips that I took was to Brazil. And I met with a lot of officials there who were dealing with a vast number of Chinese delegations who were going to Brazil to uh, invest in land. Right? They wanted to, to buy land, which eventually became impossible for a set of different reasons. But they wanted to buy land, to, mostly to grow soybeans. Uh, and the Brazilian officials said, you know, when these delegations come here, they, they basically think that, that we officials right, can simply sign away the land. Right? They come to us and say, OK, we want to do this deal. You know, just, just sign on the dotted line. But of course, that's not the way things work. But in China, that is the way it works. Right? Land deals are done between local officials and local businesses in the back room illegally expropriating land. And that's why illegal land expropriation is one of the largest sources of social unrest of the 180,000 or more protests uh, that China faces annually. So again, what we see uh, on the home front is largely what we see China doing abroad. But the story doesn't end there, and it, you know, it can have a much more positive ending. And that's something we also discovered uh, in the course of our research, which is uh, to the extent now that China is beginning to develop better uh, sort of corporate social responsibility practices, um, it's going to be exporting those as well. Uh, so, and there's pressure coming from Beijing itself uh, on Chinese firms to do a better job. So they're putting in place laws and regulations that say, you know what, if you don't undertake an environmental impact assessment in Zambia, you're not going to get any money from China Exim Bank, right? Or you can't go public on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange uh, if you have some sort of environmental black mark uh, against your firm. Uh, so they're starting to put in some regulations and strictures. I would say spottily enforced, uh, just as they are spottily enforced on the home front. But nonetheless, this is the trend within the Chinese government is to begin to hold these Chinese firms uh, to a higher standard. Uh, 
We also find that Chinese firms themselves uh, often want to do a better job. They want to compete uh, against Western multinationals. They want to be world-class uh, companies, uh, and they learn from each other. So in Peru, for example, we saw that early entrants into the mining industry, early Chinese entrants, really were bottom of the barrel. And for 10 or more decades, you know, these firms continue to have protests uh, against them uh, from Peruvian miners and, and local people, local communities. Um, but gradually, uh, later Chinese entrants, later Chinese mining firms uh, have learned. They hire Western CEOs, uh, or they hire local Peruvians to help with community relations. Uh, they hire outside firms to do environmental impact assessments, real environmental and social impact assessments. Uh, so again, beginning to transform uh, the way that they do business uh, as a result of wanting themselves, again, to be uh, world-class competitors. Uh, and I think it's important to remember uh, that it takes two to tango, right? So uh, we found very different uh, Chinese uh, experiences depending on where they were doing business. So stronger state capacity in a resource-rich country uh, generally meant that you had a better result in Chinese investment. Uh, so we found you know, countries like Mongolia, for example, putting in place laws that said, look, we're worried about uh, the Chinese exporting their labor. That's also a very big concern uh, when China comes calling, primarily for infrastructure, not so much for resource quest, but a lot of infrastructure development surrounds resource development. Um, so the Mongolians said, for every uh, Chinese that you bring in, uh, every Chinese miner, you have to hire nine Mongolian miners. Uh, now, maybe this is not so strongly enforced, uh, but the idea is there. There's an awareness right, that of how they want to negotiate and navigate uh, with the Chinese government. Uh, so that kind of state capacity you know, may be missing in a country like Zambia, for example. Uh, and therefore, Zambia will suffer more uh, in terms of uh, Chinese investment on the sort of labor or environmental uh, front. And finally, uh, I think probably the newest uh, development that we've seen is the beginning of grassroots pressure within China on Chinese firms to do a better job. Of course, there's been that uh, for a few decades now when it comes to domestic environmental issues in China. But we're just beginning to see Chinese domestic environmental NGOs uh, trying to hold Chinese firms to account when they go abroad. Uh, so for example, a Chinese NGO that goes to Burma, Myanmar, uh, and interviews, spends two weeks traveling around, talking to local communities there, and then comes back uh, and tells the Chinese firms, you know, you need to do a better job. You need to engage with local communities. It's not enough simply to strike a deal with the local officials, uh, because you're losing out uh, on, on the best deals. You're losing out because you have no public support. Uh, so I think there's, there are all these pressures now that are being exerted on Chinese firms, some of them internal to the firms themselves, but many others coming from outside uh, that I think are propelling uh, Chinese firm behavior, sort of general corporate social responsibility practices uh, in the right direction. Uh, it's too early, frankly, to say that China's turned the corner in this regard, uh, but I think the trend line is moving in a positive direction. You've heard so many things about Zambia and the environment that I have to give one little anecdote. When I was in, uh, in Zambia a couple years ago doing research for this book, I spoke with someone who told me about an, uh, a company that actually had submitted its environmental impact assessment. It was in Chinese. Uh, it was approved, despite the fact that no one in the Zambian government spoke Chinese. Um, I don't know, maybe they put it through a, you know, Google Translate. I'm suspicious. Uh, but. This is the sort of thing that happens when your capacity isn't up to scratch. So I want to talk about a last myth or set of misunderstandings, and that surrounds China's impact on global security and international politics. It's pretty easy to uh, see China's resource quest as uh, fundamentally changing political relationships, deeply undermining global security, insulating bad guys, uh, changing relationships, leading to military confrontation. Uh, you certainly see the image of uh, China's state presence in a lot of resource-rich countries. Uh, when, when I was doing research on the book, I went to Mozambique. Uh, it is not difficult to figure out that China has a strong political relationship with Mozambique uh, because the roof of the Mozambican foreign ministry is a pagoda-style roof. And the Chinese company that built it decided that would be a really nice touch uh, to put on the Mozambican foreign ministry. Uh, this is not the embassy. This is Mozambique's own foreign ministry. Uh, and it's true that as you look around the world, you see uh, places where China has resource investments and 
uh, is distorting the way the world deals with its problems. Uh, China certainly has not uh, bent over backward to be helpful on Iran, less because it imports oil from there and more because it wants to preserve opportunities uh, as an investor in Iranian oil and gas. You've seen in Sudan, uh, China, this is one of the earliest places where China invested uh, in resources, uh, the Chinese have uh, tried uh, at least to, uh, to weaken uh, the Security Council response uh, during the last decade to uh, internal conflict. And on the military front, uh, there is undoubtedly a desire within uh, pieces of the Chinese military and, and uh, senior political leadership to play more of a direct role in providing security for its own resource flows, to have a stronger navy, to have uh, a military that's able to operate more effectively abroad. And when you add more and more strong militaries to a, uh, a small area, you uh, inevitably raise the risks of conflict. When you drill down on these pieces, though, uh, what you find is that there are severe limitations, at least for the time being, to Chinese leverage. Uh, and let me flag a couple examples that I think drive this home. Uh, the first is in Iran. Uh, there was a big fear that as Western companies tried to gain leverage over the Iranian nuclear program by telling their oil and gas companies that they couldn't invest, that China would just come in, take over, uh, take over the leases, uh, pump out the oil or gas, and mean, make this essentially painless for the Iranians. And what happened? Two really striking things happened. First is that it turned out that for a lot of the developments in Iran, China either didn't have the technical capacity by itself. So actually, if you look around the world, China's often partnering with Western companies, not operating alone. So they couldn't step in because of that. Uh, there were other technical limits where uh, you, uh, the Chinese had 90% of the pieces they needed to do a development, but there were some high tech or uh, elements required, that required specialized materials that they could only get from a European supplier. And that European supplier was saying, we're not allowed to uh, play ball with you on this front. And so they weren't actually able to step in as effectively and fill that gap. Uh, at the same time that they weren't able to, they were being deterred from doing it. Um, so you had one instance where uh, Chinese companies were looking at two sorts of possibilities. One was stepping in for some Western firms that were moving out of Iran. The other was investing more in the United States. Uh, there's been a lot of Chinese activity in the last few years uh, doing joint ventures in uh, American oil and gas production. And they got a subtle, not a big broadcast, but a subtle message that they might have to make a choice. That if they invested more in Iran, people here might be concerned, politically concerned, uh, about their own investments here. And ultimately, the predominant choice was to invest in the United States rather than to invest in Iran. A second thing that we see is that uh, China may want to be hands off uh, to essentially stay out of internal politics in, company, in countries where it gets involved, but sometimes it doesn't have the choice. And it's found increasingly, for example, in Sudan and South Sudan, that it may want to stay out of what's happening there, but its investments are worthless when conflict means that it can't produce, and in particular, when conflict means that it can't operate the pipelines to get the oil that it's producing out. And so China may intend to have a we don't interfere policy, but that may not be tenable. And it's learning that as it goes through uh, some of its engagements around the world. Uh, last, last front uh, worth paying attention to is this military front. Uh, the United States wouldn't feel particularly comfortable if the Chinese military was the one responsible for security of all the resources that come back to this country. Uh, if we were in a situation where we depended on dependent on China for all that security, we would be agitating to build up our own military and provide that security for ourselves. That's what China is doing. Uh, China relies on the United States for security in the Middle East. It relies on the United States for security much closer to home. And it relies on the United States to not decide to cut off its own access to resources. So if you're China, you want to build up the capacity to provide some of the security for sea lanes that critical resources travel through for yourself. The problem is there are a lot of other things that the Chinese military wants to do. Uh, China has one aircraft carrier at this point. So even if right now it wanted to provide all the security to kick out the United States, do it for itself, it wouldn't be able to. And as we move out into the future and China does build up a greater capacity, it will be looking at a host of different ways it can use it. Will it want to use it for uh, defense, uh, or for capacity in case of a conflict over Taiwan? Will it want to use it in the sea lanes 
close to home where it's most capable of operating. Those are the places where uh, resources will get pulled to in the short run, not sending ships off to the Strait of Hormuz to replace the United States and others uh, in the Middle East. I want to move uh, pretty quickly uh, to questions and answers, but let's, let me just sort of quickly recap, I think, three themes that uh, help us at least organize how we think about China's resource question. I think I've run through a lot of what we've been talking about. The first is that to understand what China does abroad, you have to really look at how China behaves and operates at home. Uh, whether it's, uh, like Liz said, how they do environmental impact assessments or handle labor, or whether it's this broader question of state control versus limited administrative capacity uh, that allows companies to often do their own thing, uh, that same scene that prevails at home prevails abroad. Uh, there are other influences abroad, but that's an, a critical starting point. I think the second is that regardless of whether the Chinese state is controlling or is not, or whether its intentions are nefarious or not, the fact that China is an enormous and growing economy means that what it does is consequential. There's a habit of saying, if China is well-intentioned, there is no problem. And if China is ill-intentioned, there is. Intentions aren't the only thing that matter here. Uh, China has consequences, whether it's for markets or for security or for prices and economies, regardless of what its intentions are. And the third piece I drive home uh, is sort of the counterpart to the first. Yes, China brings its own approach to the world. Yes, China has different ways of doing things. But the global system is pretty resilient. It responds in some strong ways. When China tried to put quotas on rare earth materials, uh, those got struck down at the WTO. Still a work in progress, but the system started to respond. When China has pushed prices up, the system has responded by encouraging more production, cutting consumption, and driving technology development. Uh, when China has tried to uh, change the way uh, politics and economics mix in some of the countries where it invests, it hasn't been able to sustain that all the time. Uh, and as China has gained exposure to the rest of the world, it's learned things. It's learned ways to do things better that are good for itself, but also good for the rest of the world. And I think we'll continue to see this interplay between China bringing something new to the world and the world adapting and influencing in China itself in pretty strong ways, uh, not just over the next few years, but really over the next few decades as China's rise continues. So thank you all for, uh, for your attention. One of the pers myths I have, at least about China, or that I'm curious to hear you talk about is uh, I often get the impression that that parts of China are are desperately poor and desperately resource constrained, and so to some extent China has to do what it's trying to do to import all of these resources from outside of the country, because not only do they want to grow, but they have to figure out how to feed people and raise the, these these desperately poor people out of poverty, which is perhaps different than certainly different than what the US would have been in the situation of probably even different than what Japan and, and Britain, who are much more resource constrained, were. And I was wondering, can you, can you talk a little bit about to what extent are they doing what they're doing because they feel like they have to lift their society up versus just seeking to grow their economy? Um, let me say a couple of words, and maybe Mike wants to chime in. I think one of the um, uh, sort of commodities that we looked at, we looked at water issues. And I think there's probably no greater uh, concern in China. You think air pollution is a problem. Actually, the water scarcity issue is a much bigger problem for China, and particularly in the north and the, and the west of the country. Uh, and so uh, we looked at how China uh, is, uh, you know, China is, is actually water rich, right? But because of its uh, pollution and because of its uh, sort of the degradation of its resources, you know, uh, half of the sort of 50,000 rivers in China have simply dried up and disappeared uh, over the past few decades. Um, it's being forced to undertake major river diversions. Uh, it, is, uh, it seeks to uh, control right, the water resources uh, that flow into places like Kazakhstan or India or down uh, into the, you know, the Mekong. Um, and, uh, and so it, it encounters some battles with these countries uh, because, in fact, uh, you know, they need this water as well right, to grow their own economies. Um, but China is not interested in, in negotiating, in part because this water is so very desperately needed uh, by China itself. Um, you know, when you're asking whether it, the Chinese, uh, China is seeking resources to grow its economy or to lift another 100 to 200 million people out of poverty, they're, they're kind of the same thing, 
right? Because that has always been the mission uh, of the Chinese government, right? To continue to lift uh, hundreds of millions of people out of the poverty as they have done over the past several decades. I mean, one of the things that Mike raised uh, was this issue of rebalancing the economy and the urbanization process that's taking place, right? So moving a lot of those desperately poor people, migrant workers, uh, into cities, right? That's how they believe they're gonna develop a middle class. While that may have some positive ramifications for China's resource quest, the truth is that urban residents use four times the energy and three times the water that rural residents do. So some of that rebalancing of the economy could actually prove even more challenging uh, for China's you know, resource quest. So I think absolutely they're out there you know, seeking resources to continue to fuel the excellent lifestyles of the urban residents uh, and the coastal China, but they're also seeking those resources uh, to, to lift up those other two to 300 million uh, people who are not uh, living uh, the coastal life. Uh, just to build on, on that, I think it's both. Uh, when you import a lot of iron ore and use a lot of energy in order to produce steel to build up cities so that you can bring people in and lift them out of poverty, that's certainly what you're talking about. Uh, when you do it to ship that steel to somewhere else and sell it, these are capital intensive, not labor intensive businesses. This is not bringing a lot of people out of poverty. Uh, that's not to say that it's good or bad, but different pieces of the resource dynamic are, can be more or less about poverty alleviation, broad-based growth versus uh, returns at the top. I think it's also worth separating the trade piece from the others. Uh, the drive for trade, the drive to uh, have resources to fuel growth and to fuel uh, move into the middle class uh, is certainly there. The investment imperative abroad, I think, is different. Uh, and, th and it's not all that, it's, it's more similar to what you saw in Japan, what you saw in the United States, uh, what you saw in Britain. Uh, partly driven by the fact that you have big companies with the capacity to invest. What do big companies with the capacity and opportunity to invest do? They typically invest. And so not a shock that Chinese companies are doing that as well. On top of that, to the extent that they're vertically integrated, so they have these responsibilities downstream, whether it's in refineries or steel mills, they often want some security. Uh, of supply, even if they're not physically moving it, at least some financial security uh, through o upstream ownership. And so you see some of that happening. So I think it depends on the, on the particular dynamic that you're thinking about, uh, how much you tie that to the sort of rise of people out of poverty into the middle class and how much this is about uh, making rich people richer. So I actually have a question. Um, I did my thesis actually on Chinese carbon emissions and US GDP, so kind of focusing on like the Chinese resource consumption and trade piece um, on all these emissions embodied in trade. Could you just speak a bit to like how we're putting the onus on China even though we're probably indirectly consuming a lot and driving these prices? So it depends on which resource you're talking about. So for people here who didn't do their thesis on this issue, um, the way we typically count emissions and resource consumption is where the smokestack is or where the resource gets transformed. So uh, if I have a factory in China producing widgets for someone in the United States, it's their emissions, it's their energy consumption, so and even though it's my widget. And you get into a lot of discussions about responsibility, uh, particularly in the climate space because the climate space immediately runs you into a discussion of responsibility. Uh, the problem there and, and certainly a lot of our emissions reductions, not all of them, but a substantial part of our emissions reductions have come from offshoring manufacturing uh, to places like China. The problem there is that the way to take responsibility for that is for us to say, well, we will pay a fee, you know, just like we might want to charge a fee on uh, US emissions, we'll pay a fee on activities, uh, on products that uh, ultimately come from Chinese emissions. Uh, politically, the Chinese hate that. So they like the responsibility idea, they hate the solution to it. And uh, in, the, in the practical world, it's the solution that ends up having uh, the consequences. Uh, so that's a tricky piece to navigate. I think on the broader resource question, look, we all feel the consequences. And I, I don't think it's particularly useful, especially when you're talking about who's contributing to price rises, to have it as a, a sort of blame game, um, at least at a moral level. I do think it's useful to understand what drives these changes, and that gets back to this previous one. Uh, most Chinese uh, you know, steel production is driven by a demand from the Chinese domestic economy. Uh, that is not about export to the United States, except sort of in a second order kind of way. Um, you need cities in order to have people working, and people working in order to ship things. Uh, but some of it is, uh, is sent to 
to the United States. And, and trying to differentiate between these pieces uh, is, is useful. And there's a paper, the guy, uh, a, a guy who I like a lot at Princeton, who's a mechanical engineer, but also studies climate policy issues together with a couple uh, folks. Uh, I'm trying to remember which California university, but one of them is doing trying to differentiate between these pieces. How do you go a level beyond the sort of is it ours or is it theirs? And think about which resource consumption, which emissions are for building up the domestic economy and which are really sort of just to send it back to us. Thank you all for speaking with us today. And we will have time to sign books at the end. So thank you. Thanks.